I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. This is a story of identity. An American dream, which vision expands the horizon for those who seek enlightenment. Since its inception in 1787, the African Methodist Episcopal Church has reached global proportions. While the expansion continues, its history dates back to the dawn of the United States of America, when a 27-year-old African American by the name of Richard Allen and his fellow parishioners stormed out of the prestigious St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia after they were mistreated by church officials due to the segregation of seating. Slavery, an image so horrific it brings the shame which indicts our country's rich heritage. But for a young Richard Allen possessing hope and a vision, this image would have to be challenged and overcome. Richard Allen was born a slave on February 14, 1760 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He, his parents, along with three siblings, were owned by a prominent attorney by the name of Benjamin Chu. When Richard was seven years old, a slow economy in Philadelphia caused Chu's legal practice to suffer. So rather than face bankruptcy, Chu sold Richard's family to a wealthy farmer by the name of Stokely Sturgis in Delaware. It was fortunate for the family that they remained intact. But unlike the loud labor and comfort of the Chu house, they were now faced with the grueling chores out in the fields. Much to this dismay, Richard loved Stokely and viewed him as a father figure since he treated his slaves like family. The family worked for Stokely for a decade, then tragedy struck. The Stokely farm was on the verge of bankruptcy. So once again, Richard's family would be sold, only this time separated. Richard's mother and three siblings would be sent away. Richard Allen described slavery as a bitter pill. Shortly thereafter, there had been talk of a secret meeting among the slaves on the plantation. So a 17-year-old Richard Allen, now painfully distraught, would follow behind other young slaves into the woods. There, his entire life would be changed forever. He would hear a sermon delivered by a Methodist circuit writer named John Gray. That moment, Richard's spirit was completely illuminated and he began proclaiming the gospel thereafter. I was awakened and brought to see myself poor, wretched, and undone, and without the mercy of God, must be lost. Shortly after, I obtained mercy through the blood of Christ and was constrained to seek the Lord. I went rejoicing several days and was happy in the Lord. In conversing with many old, experienced Christians, I was brought under doubts and was tempted to believe I was deceived and was constrained to seek the Lord afresh. I went with my head bowed down for many days. My sins were a heavy burden. I was tempted to believe there was no mercy for me. I cried unto the Lord night and day. I cried unto Him who delighteth to hear the prayers of a poor sinner. And all of a sudden my dungeon shook, and glory to God, I cried. My soul was filled, I cried. 
enough for me. The Savior died. When Richard Allen heard the gospel message of salvation, which is the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, short, uh, in a nutshell, when he heard that gospel story and believed, he describes it as a dungeon-shaking experience. In other words, uh, something happened and, and uh, I felt change coming into my life. And I think that's the story of every person who experiences salvation. Uh, you recognize that a change happens, not something that you yourself uh, would start or instigate or have any control over other than the fact that you acknowledge that you have a need for salvation in your spiritual life. And when that happens, you recognize some changes. The old people used to say, I, things I used to say, I don't say anymore. But places I used to go, I don't go anymore. Uh, preacher would say, my hands look new. And my feet did too. And what that means is that the color doesn't change, the shape doesn't change. Uh, but it just simply means that uh, how I did things before, I don't do them anymore. Something in my life has changed. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Under Gray's leadership, Allen would become indoctrinated into the Methodist faith. Gray would encourage the slaves to lead a God-fearing, righteous life. Allen's life was then changed dramatically. Richard liked the Methodist belief of anti-slavery and good discipline. He continued to meet with Gray and other circuit riders in the forest. Stokely became aware of these meetings and fortunately enough, he encouraged them. Stokely boasted that religious faith helped the slaves become more diligent workers. With this newly found spirituality, Richard Allen could now justify a means to emancipate himself. He would then impress this upon his slave master, who would then give him the opportunity to work off his freedom. Allen would then teach himself to read and write and purchase the freedom for he and his brother. Meanwhile, on July 4th, 1776, our founding fathers would sign the most important document this country will ever know the Declaration of Independence and our United States Constitution is born. To give rise to the open expression of all free religion. A few months later another circuit writer, Reverend Freeborn Gerritsen, stopped by the farm. Once a slave owner himself, he preached to Stokely denouncing slavery.
Garrison was a powerful speaker and had a tremendous impact on Stokely. That same evening, Garrison read a scripture from the book of Daniel, chapter 5, verse 27. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Stokely was awakened and convinced that slavery was an abomination in accordance with the scriptures. Garrison declared to Stokely that on the day of judgment, all slave owners would be found wanting and their sins would weigh heavily against them. Stokely was deeply moved and all but inclined to set all his slaves free. However, he was still deeply in debt. He would advise his slaves to get jobs and work off their freedom. So Richard took odd jobs where he could, chopping cord wood to raise the money to buy his freedom. After five years of hard work, Richard purchased his freedom for the amount of $2,000 and took the surname Allen. He was a free man and the bondage that suppressed him was lifted for good. free man, the direction Allen would take would be to travel back to Philadelphia to acquire employment and establish his own identity. The life for a free black man in the 1700s was bittersweet. While freedom was a treasure, independence meant almost complete alienation since jobs were extremely limited for blacks. In Philadelphia, Richard was on his own and would now have to rely solely on himself for everything, such as food, clothes, and shelter. He took whatever work came his way, cutting cordwood and working in brickyards, and sometimes even driving a salt wagon. It was at this time the American Revolution was at hand. General George Washington would lead his troops across the Delaware to Pennsylvania. Richard had no interest in politics, although found ample time to look for opportunities to preach. Allen discovered a large black population in Philadelphia, both slave and free. The city was well diverse in culture, having a great English and German contingent. Philadelphia had a liberal heritage with a strong Quaker society that had the ideals for Christianity and social freedom. 
The vision Allen had as a free man was to address the issue of slavery. He felt that black brothers and sisters were the worst cases of oppression. He vowed to help the freedom cause by any means necessary. But he also believed that the identity of the free blacks were in question. Among the array of prominent black figures in young Philadelphia would include someone who would become a lifelong colleague to Allen, a distinguished minister by the name of Absalom Jones. Together, they would organize the Free African Society. This society was designed to provide a sense of affiliation while provide a support group for free Africans, as they were called in those days. The Free African Society was non-denomination and non-denominational and non-sectarian. And what it was designed to do was to not only have a free space for worship, in an African way, but also to practice one of the most ancient values we have as African people that reach all the way back to ancient Egyptian t uh, sacred texts like the Husea, which says that you measure the moral quality of any society by how it treats its most vulnerable. And so the society was dedicated in honor of the teachings of ancient Africa that said we must give food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, and a boat to those without one. We must be a staff of support for those of old age, shelter for the battered, care for the sick, a raft for the drowning, and a ladder for those trapped in the pit of despair. And so even though they're working in the tradition of Christianity now, this is a deep and ancient African teaching, and they were practicing that by forming the Free African Society. His decision to become an itinerant minister was bold since blacks were discriminated against wherever they traveled. Yet for Allen, preaching was a way to put his faith into action. He realized how religious faith could create a transformation in a person. Allen's life was exemplary of the Christian walk. Richard was a staunch Methodist and was loyal to the faith. While Allen remained affiliated with the Methodist doctrine, at the Conference of 1784, when Methodism established itself as an official denomination in the United States, independent from the original church founded by John Wesley in England, Richard would become acquainted with several of the denomination's great evangelists. After the Revolution, the Methodists would become the Episcopal Church ordaining Bishop Asbury as the first bishop. Bishop Asbury had taken a keen interest in Allen and invited him to tour the South on a mission assignment. After contemplating it further, Richard declined the invitation, fearing it would be too dangerous to go down south. He didn't want to risk being hauled back into slavery. But in 1786, a better opportunity would present itself. Richard Allen was invited to speak at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church. In the midst of stirring souls at St. George's, Allen was making a name for himself. The year that Richard would spend fellowshipping would suddenly turn to crises. The black population at St. George's had grown considerably. It was apparent that the blacks would face a devastating turning point in their lives, which would change the course of history forever. November 1787, a newly renovated gallery upstairs in the sanctuary of St. George's seemed the perfect place to pray and worship for black parishioners Absalom Jones, Richard Allen, and William White. After the first hymn had just ended, the elder led the congregation in prayer. While in prayer, Allen
Allen was interrupted when he heard the commotion of a trustee removing Jones from his seat. Just then, another trustee grabbed White. Jones pleaded with the trustee to allow him to finish his prayer. The trustee refused. So along with Allen, Absalom Jones, William White, and the sector of blacks, unanimously decided to walk out of St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church. Richard Allen and company had just finished renovating St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church. They were the artisans, the carpenters, they had done all of the work, and the church was brand new. They arrived late one morning to worship, kneel in the lobby of the church, are told by the officers of the church, you can't pray here, go to your separate seating, your segregated seating in the balcony. They said, please allow us to finish our prayers. No, get up now. And then comes the historic statement. If you will allow us to finish our prayers, we will go and we will trouble you no more. That was the first major walk out of blacks in North America. Now they found themselves without a church. Allen began to reconsider his itinerant status. Absalom Jones, who was also a Methodist minister, elected to leave the Methodist denomination altogether, while the majority of the black congregation agreed with Jones to leave the Methodist faith as well. The group would look to Allen for answers. Allen found it to be essential to remain a Methodist. He liked their principles and firmly believed that blacks needed good discipline with a plain doctrine. I must be a Methodist, for I was awakened unto it. With Catholicism now dwindling in the New World, the Protestant faith would now take precedence throughout the Northeast. Among the three major doctrines were the Anglican Church, the Quaker Society, and the Methodist. Methodism appealed more to the blacks since it was more charitable. It dealt with things like education and social reform. And it was just much more conducive for the black struggle, especially since the Baptist sect had not yet risen to prominence throughout this region. Once having an abolitionist belief, the Methodists had softened their stance, almost advocating slavery. Elders would preach about scriptures of exhortations on the faithful servant. As the Methodist church grew, the anti-slave doctrine weakened and became more segregated. The period of the walkout was an exasperating time for Allen. Still having only arrived in Philadelphia two years prior, he still had to address the social needs of the free black society and the spiritual needs of the flock. After the walkout, Richard Allen was now forced to reassess his place in life. No longer having the support from St. George's, he would now have to find work and make provisions for he and his flock. And although jobs were scarce, land was abundant. And at no other time in our country's history would we be more reliant on entrepreneurship these businesses shared reciprocities which were mutual and in the 18th century Philadelphia served as our country's industrial capital giving Richard Allen all the resources necessary to open a shoe repair and a blacksmith shop with which to facilitate a ministry to begin his missions work Richard Allen realized he needed to establish a strong financial base in order to build a new church, which certainly could not afford him a salary. So he worked diligently as a chimney sweep, raising a surplus of money to develop a strong budget. His economic strides were extraordinary, and the financial gain he acquired are still considered to be epic for his time. He established both a shoe repair and a blacksmith shop. He eventually bought a vacant lot on the corners of 6th 
and Lombard Streets in Philadelphia. Before long, Allen was becoming a force to reckon with. His influence had a major impact in the business community of blacks. He was among the elite group of black entrepreneurs like Philadelphia-born James Fortin, an extremely successful businessman and a social activist in the anti-slavery movement. As Allen's resources grew, he devoted more time towards the Free African Society, a non-religious group that focused on social issues. Some of the society's endeavors included helping needy blacks and temporarily serving as a replacement for the Methodist Church. The greatest challenge for Allen was to somehow unite the Free African Society into a church body. But with members objecting to remain a part of the Methodist faith, it would create a rift in the group. On June 20th, 1789, after Richard Allen's unsuccessful fusion of the FAS as an independent black church, he held a meeting with the society where they declared him officially disunited due to his unwillingness to comply with the group's discipline. He left the Free African Society because it opted to go with the Episcopal Church and he believed that uh, Africans were better in the Methodist Church. And so he stayed with the Methodist Church and formed his own uh, church, uh, that is to say, Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And finally, breaking all together in 1816, uh, formed the African Methodist Church as a totally independent African church. Allen would utilize this time to organize an official black Methodist church, while his former associate Absalom Jones, with the support of the FAS, formed the denomination of the Episcopalians. And in 1794, they assisted him in establishing the first black church in the United States. Jones, 14 years older than Allen, had the first black church called St. Thomas. Jones rallied his flock, who wanted little to do with the ideas of Allen. The two were not rivals, however. They would still consider themselves to be strong allies towards the black cause. Methodism was more... Episcopalian has a tendency to elitism. And Methodism was more a religion for the common people. This is not to say that they didn't develop a lot of intellectuals in the Methodist Church and very fine preachers. They did. They do today. But um, there was more of a feeling for the poor and oppressed in Methodism than there was in the Episcopal. And so it, 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 John Wesley was really a very saintly man and had some of that orientation himself. Uh, was a reformer. Um, and you know, people in the Episcopal Church, the people in the Anglican Church, Wesley was thrown out of the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church is, of course, the, the original Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church is the American version of the Anglican Church. And uh, one of the things that the Anglicans looked down their nose at, the Methodists, they said, this appeals to the rabble, you know, the lower classes. <laughs> uh, and so there's more of a feeling for the poor among the Methodists and in Methodist theology. And so I think that that would be a good reason why Richard Allen would be more inclined to stay in the Methodist rather than going. Uh, in 1794, the two would again join forces by putting each of their church buildings on hold to supply relief to the victims of the yellow fever epidemic which ravaged the city of Philadelphia. After Philadelphia, Mayor Matthew Clarkson pleaded with Jones and Allen to provide aid, the two obliged. It was believed at that time that blacks were less susceptible to yellow fever, yet many of them died from the illness. The two came across scores of dead bodies as they entered the homes of fever victims. One occasion they saw two children crying over their dead mother while their father laid in agony. The two ministers directed other blacks to provide necessary treatment. 
Alan accepted the daunting task of administering cleanup crews to gather the dead. By the time the epidemic rose to its greatest height, doctors in Philadelphia had either contracted the illness or were extremely exhausted. The wealthier people fled the city, however many poor people died. In the late 18th century, there was little known about the disease. Dr. Benjamin Rush taught Allen and Jones how to treat the fever victims with medicines which induced bleeding. That was thought to be the remedy. By its end, about 5,000 people lost their lives, approximately one-tenth of the population. Mayor Clarkson praised Jones and Allen for their efforts. The epidemic of Philadelphia gave the community a chance to see that Allen was both a leader and a humanitarian. He was considered a man of honor. He left his church platform and responded to the needs of the people. This crisis gave way to St. George's support of Allen once again. Immediately, they assisted him in establishing an African church. The city of Philadelphia was grateful, except for one. Matthew Carey claimed that many black volunteers charged enormous prices to remove the dead. He also asserted that many of them rummaged through the pockets of the deceased. The whites were in a position of having the disease and blacks had it less, and so blacks were caring for the white and saving a lot of white, guys, white people's lives. And so whites felt dependent on blacks. And I think this happens in any time that, that one group exploits and dominates another. If the other group gets some power, they fear retribution. See? You know, uh, and so I think there was fear of retribution. And so they projected onto blacks a lot of, of retributive acts that blacks were not even guilty of committing. Um, and so it just became, it's ironic because here were blacks actually serving whites and saving white lives, and they just ended up incurring more resentment. It was said that blacks showed favoritism by attending to victims of their own color. Allen and Jones responded to these charges in a pamphlet called A Narrative of the Proceedings of the Black People During the Awful Calamity in Philadelphia, which they clarified the rumors that Carey was spreading about the blacks of Philadelphia. They insisted that the deaths were proportionately the same with the ratio of blacks to whites. They further explained that black volunteers gave of their time and money. They were forced to charge only when no other volunteers came forward. Finally, Jones and Allen contended that Carey was one of those who fled the city. Their role was as citizens, and what they did, I think, that was so tantamount was establish themselves as citizens, not separate entities, not as blacks, not as African Americans but as citizens that were bound and drawn into this same situation. In his memoirs, he mentions black people who were dying of this yellow fever as well as whites. He spoke of uh, the interdependency that people seemed to be drawing on each other. Black people ministering and helping white people. White people ministering and helping black people. And the two of these uh, Giants of the community were able to motivate and pull people together and basically just be the, go about the job of being good citizens. On July 29, 1794, Allen's church was finally established. He moved his blacksmith shop to 6th and Lombard Streets, the lot he purchased earlier. A group of blacks joined him along with Bishop Asbury to make the dedication. The church was named Bethel, a Hebrew word meaning the house of the Lord. The name was suggested by Reverend John Dickens, the elder of St. George's, and taken from a biblical verse, Genesis chapter 28, verse 19, that reads, he called the name of the place Bethel. Allen's dream of a black church had come true. 
At last, he had his African church, and decades later, it would be known as Mother Bethel. After Bethel's dedication by Bishop Asbury, it would be considered an African parish within the Methodist Episcopal Church. The church had just 20 members, and its status among the Methodist Church remained obscure. But Allen never anticipated that his church would be governed by St. George. The Reverend John Dickens had assisted the dedication, but was opposed to the idea of a semi-autonomous black church in Philadelphia. So to prevent any complications, Allen and a trustee of Bethel issued what would later be considered the church's Declaration of Independence on November 3, 1794. Wherefore, as from time to time, many inconveniences have arisen from white people and people of color mixing together in public assemblies, more particularly places of worship, we have thought it necessary to provide for ourselves a convenient house to assemble in, separate from the white brethren. By declaring independence, the group stated that it was not to harm or offend their white brethren, but allow the blacks the freedom to worship without any discouragement. While Bethel was subject to the Methodist Church, only blacks could worship and assemble within the church walls. All temporal affairs of the church, such as finances relating to their doctrine, would be controlled by them. They declared themselves a branch of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. From this day forward, they would be deemed, under the auspices, African Methodist Episcopal, A.M.E. This term, African Methodist Episcopal, was appropriate, since during this period, blacks here in America were referred to as Africans, and the A.M.E. concept was black culture at its finest and its significance we could equate today to the NBA, NFL, BET and Soul Train. The black church in every way was as crucial to our social identity as it would be to our forward progress. The church was not yet a fully independent church in religious eyes. It was still wholly bound to the elder at St. George's because neither Allen or any other black had been ordained as a minister. To make matters worse, the Reverend Ezekiel Cooper was not going to give up property control over Bethel without a fight. Technically, the Methodists had control over the property at Bethel since it was affiliated with the Methodist Conference and all church property wherein was trusted to the Methodist Episcopal Church. However, the entire congregation of Bethel regarded Bethel as theirs since they paid for the property. Allen said of this conflict, our warfares and troubles now begin afresh. Ezekiel manipulated the trustees of Bethel to sign for their independence when in actuality they signed to incorporate themselves with the Methodist Church. In realizing it later, Allen said, Our property was all then consigned to the conference for the present bishops and elders that belong to the white conference. And our property is gone. Being ignorant of incorporations, we cheerfully agreed thereto. Nevertheless, for all public appearances, the tensions between Bethel and St. George's seemed resolved. The complexion took on a harmonious look and life went on. Within the first two years, Bethel had grown from a membership of 20 to 121. 
and undergo a series of renovations. The years that followed, Allen would spend establishing his doctrine. His mission was to dedicate his life to helping the poor, the downtrodden, and the oppressed. Richard Allen's greatest passion would be to address to those who keep slaves and approve the practice. He would make parallels of the ancient Egyptians and the Israelites who were enslaved like the blacks in America. Consider how hateful slavery is in the sight of God who hath destroyed kings and princes for the oppression of the poor slaves. Pharaoh and princess with the posterity of King Saul were destroyed by the protector and avenger of slaves. Would you not suppose the Israelites to be utterly unfit for freedom and that it was impossible for them to obtain any degree of excellence? As the Israelites were debased by their bondage, so too were blacks, diminished and dehumanized by slavery. A crime hateful to the God of love. If you love your children, if you love your country, if you love the God of love, clear your hands from slaves, not your children or your country with them. My heart has been sorry for the bloodshed of the oppressors as well as the oppressed, both guilty of each other's blood. In the sight of him who hath said, he that sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Allen opened the church doors to anyone who needed help. On July 23, 1795, when 30 slaves from Jamaica who had been freed by their master, David Barclay, arrived in Philadelphia, the FAS turned to Allen for help. He housed all the free Jamaicans at Bethel until he found homes for them. Allen's mission, outreach, was evolving toward a thrift ministry that converted lives. However, Richard still wasn't ordained. Bishop Asbury came to visit Bethel on a routine assignment. He officially ordained Richard Allen as a deacon in 1799. During this time, news would travel that other black Methodists were building churches in the country. In Baltimore, a group of black Methodists walked out of a church about the same time as Allen and his colleagues walked out of St. George's. They were led by a former slave named Daniel Coker, who fled to New York and arranged to buy his freedom. They were struggling to establish an identity, so they organized Bethel, Baltimore, and a school for the free blacks. Allen realized that there were other black organizations that resembled the FAS. 